Black Swan, Grey Rhino, London Whale, Unicorn. Why do financial markets like to use animals as adjectives? Today we will tell you the story behind these words. If you are interested in this kind of content, remember to subscribe to this channel. The first is the Black Swan. A black swan is an unpredictable event that is beyond what is normally expected of a situation and has potentially severe consequences. The term was first known to the general public through the book The Black Swan, published in 2007. The author is a financial writer and former Wall Street trader Nassim Taleb. Many important financial concepts are also proposed by him. The origin of black swans comes from the 17th century. Before Europeans discovered Australia, they believed that swans were only white, and there were no other colored swans in the world. But after arriving in Australia, the black swan was unexpectedly discovered. In theory, no matter how many white swans there are, if one black swan appears, it can completely break people's previous cognition. And whether this black swan will appear, we can never predict. Based on such characteristics, Taleb summarizes a black swan event into three characteristics. First, it is completely impossible to predict the probability of a black swan, which may never happen, or it may happen tomorrow. Second, if the consequences are very serious. Third, people always find out the reasons for many occurrences after they happen and think that they can be predicted and avoided. And the third point is probably the most often overlooked feature of the concept of a black swan, but it is probably the most important. Taleb argues that in a black swan event, all the statistical probabilities and predictions we normally use are invalid, because they all rely on past data. However, examples of overconfidence in mathematical models are very common in financial markets. For example, in the 1990s, there was a famous fund on Wall Street, Long-Term Capital Management (LTCM). They built a complex data model based on historical data to formulate a risk-free arbitrage policy. This strategy is very simple, buy a low-priced 10-year treasury bonds, and sell high-priced treasury bonds. The price of the bond is then predicted to revert to the mean. To put it simply, if an item is worth about $10, buy it when the price is lower than $10, vice versa. This spread is small, to maximize profits, LTCM uses a lot of leverage. It is such a simple strategy that allows the fund company to make huge profits. In 1994, the first year of establishment, the rate of return reached 28%, the second year yield reached 59%. The third year yield remains at 57%. In 1996, they made more than $2.1 billion in one year. The most amazing thing is that this company only has more than 100 people. By 1997, when the Asian financial crisis hit, LTCM still had a 25% yield. So far, the company has barely lost money and hasn't been volatile. However, in 1998, a black swan happened. Based on historical data, LTCM believed that interest rates in emerging markets would decrease and interest rates in developed countries would rise. They bought a lot of emerging market bonds and sold US treasuries at the same time. But in August, Russia suddenly announced that it was going to default on its national debt, and neither the foreign debt nor the domestic debt was ready to be repaid. As a result, Russian government bonds depreciated sharply, and the market began to crash. LTCM lost $500 million in one day or 15% of its total capital. After three months, it lost 90%. The Fed had to call and other financial institutions to bail them out. Hearing this, you might think that it's just because the company is too greedy, and they don't have a stop loss. LTCM is very attentive to risk, but they hope to use mathematical models to predict risk. Their model estimates that market price fluctuations are random and normal distribution. That said, extreme events are hard to come by because once there is abnormal volatility, the market quickly corrects and returns to normal distribution. According to their calculations, the company's maximum daily losses would not exceed $35 million. It is a pity that the emergence of the black swan, in the end, invalidated all predictions. This also indirectly proves that black swans are unpredictable. Any event that we can think of now is not a black swan in the strict sense. But we don't have to be afraid of black swans, because the arrival of black swans is also an opportunity to get rich. If you learn to diversify your risks and reserve a sum of money to enter the financial market at any time when the market crashes, it is a good time for you to enter the market. The second word we often hear is the grey rhino. A black swan is an event that is difficult to happen but has a huge impact, while a grey rhino is an event that has a high probability and has a huge impact. Most rhinos are grey, so we wouldn't be surprised to see a grey rhino. They are huge and walk slowly. When we meet a rhino, we may not run away immediately, we will take out our phone to take a picture. But if the rhino is willing to run, it must be faster than you. If it came running towards us, we would probably have been hit before we could react. 
The metaphor of the gray rhino was proposed by financial author Michelle Wucker in the book of the same name. What about those gray rhino incidents in real life? For example, global warming. Bill Gates started reminding people of the dangers of global warming many years ago, but it is only recently that we have heard many companies announce carbon neutrality as a corporate development goal. Why is it so long apart? Because global climate change is a slow process, changing only a little every year, we may not feel immediate danger. At the same time, this is a major global event. We will feel that as an individual, we can do very limited. Even if I don't turn on the aircon, my neighbors turn it on. In financial markets, the 2008 financial crisis is a well-known gray rhino. In the movie The Big Short, the protagonists have begun to discover that such mortgages are problematic, and they were not the only ones who found the problem. Many in the financial world know there are problems with this approach, but everyone thinks that everyone does it, so I do too. It wasn't until the gray rhinos arrived that everyone realized that a change was needed. The third word introduced is the London whale. Unlike the first two terms, the London whale does not represent an economic phenomenon, but an event that occurred in 2012. JP Morgan Chase is an issuer giant in the bond market. They hold too many bonds, if the market conditions deteriorate, the risk will be very large. So, their CIO department in London is ready to find a way to hedge their positions. Typically, there are two ways to hedge. The first is to short some related assets. The second is through credit default swap, CDs. However, neither method worked for JP Morgan. First, JP Morgan holds too many bonds, and if it goes short, it will have a huge and immediate impact on the market. If they use CDs, it is too expensive. So smart traders thought of a way. Sell the 10-year CDs index or CDX. Also, buy a 5-year CDX. That is, it is predicted that the future spread will decrease, and the short-term spread will increase. Similar strategies may also be used by many people when making options. Since JP Morgan is a financial giant, selling many 10-year CDX will cause the corresponding CDX contract to become cheap, cheap enough to be seriously undervalued. At this time, other hedge funds found that CDX was undervalued, saw it as a risk-free arbitrage opportunity, and began to buy in large quantities. But the weird thing happened, no matter what they bought, the price of the index was still very cheap. Because no matter what they buy, there's always someone selling 10-year CDX, and only the CIO of JP Morgan has the strength to do so. At the same time, the matter also spread to the media, and the Wall Street Journal published an article saying that London Wales disrupted the bond market and manipulated the CDs index. JP Morgan, who originally saw this report, disagreed and thought it was just a normal operation. Unfortunately, the European debt crisis broke out two weeks later, the risk of corporate defaults rose, and the CDX market suddenly began to fluctuate. Coupled with the exposure of trading strategies, various hedge funds approached like sharks. There was even a department within the company that did the reverse. In the end, JP Morgan could only close the position, losing $6 billion in two months. This event may not mean much to us, but one thing struck me. Once you expose your trading strategy in the financial markets, there will be opponents immediately eating away at your profits, even if you were the most powerful financial institution. The last one, and the one we hear the most in our daily life, is the unicorn. In business, a unicorn means a privately held startup company valued at over $1 billion. If you are an early stage venture capital, invest in a company in angel round or around. If the company is already valued at $1 billion, you should have made at least 10 times your investment. If you can make 10 times the profit, or if you found a unicorn, you should be very happy. The company's logo will be put on the company's official website soon. Then start sharing how you found the unicorn. Speaking of angel investment, one of the biggest unicorns of the past decade should be Airbnb. YC invested $20,000 in Angel Round in exchange for a 6% stake in Airbnb. Although the 6% stake has been diluted later, by the time Airbnb goes public, there will be at least a return of several hundred million dollars. The $20,000 is at least a 10,000-fold increase. Of course, Airbnb is one of our favorite companies. About it, we still have too many stories to share with you. How did the founding team develop the company when it owed hundreds of thousands of credit cards? If there is a chance in the future, we will introduce it to you in detail. Here is Monopony, welcome to like, comment and subscribe. See you next episode.